Heavenly Father, uh, this morning we ask that you grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit, pour your latter rain out upon us, prepare our hearts and minds for the message of the hour. We ask that the work that we're doing to put this message out into the internet uh, would be successful as well. And we ask for increased light and uh, pray that you'll do this at this time in Jesus' name. Amen. It may not have, I mean, I said it directly yesterday, so I'm sure everyone understood, but it may not have clicked. What I was trying to do yesterday, among other things, is show the different components of the ladder of the midnight cry message for the priest, the message that we have. So we started, I don't know if we started, but we went to Daniel 11, 11 through 15. Um, with Rafi and Paneum, and we showed that that we didn't show, but we understand that's where the Lord removed his hand from an understanding in our foundational message, as he had done with the Millerites when he removed his hand from the fullness of your mistake. Um, he removed his hand providentially on the first day of the first month in 1844. So it's at that point that you see the Midnight Cry message in Millerite history being developed and put in place. So I'm saying that's one of the reasons that we understand that Rafi and Paniam and him removing his hand is part of our midnight cry message. Uh, we looked at Loughborough's dreams and I'm arguing that there's been three uh, significant pieces of the midnight cry message for our history that are symbolized by the dirty water in Loughborough's dreams. Uh, water being the message, but the, the mud in the water being the, that there was part of the message corrupted. You can't separate the message from the messenger any more than you can separate the dancers from the dance. So the, the corruption of the message that came with Ezra 7-9 or Rafi and Paneum or the chronology um, is speaking about the human elements that were there at that place. I'm understanding the human elements um, are, the three human elements are representing, uh, are represented by the line of the papacy in Daniel 11. We, we touched on that briefly. But in any case, what I wanted to see is, I, I took Rafi and Paneum from Daniel 11, and I wanted to start showing the specific connections to certain passages of Scripture it's not the whole Bible. I mean, certainly the whole Bible would connect one way or another, but there are certain passages of Scripture that are directly connected um, with Rafi and Paneum. So we went to Isaiah 7 and 8. We didn't look closely at Isaiah 6, but Isaiah 6 is where Isaiah sees the glory of the Lord. He's humbled in the dust, and he's raised up as a messenger. And based upon verse 3 in Isaiah 6, we put that experience at 9-11. Um, where the angels say, holy, 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 the earth is full of his glory. And we know that on 9-11, the angel came down and the earth was lightened with his glory. So we put Isaiah 6 uh, in there. And then in Isaiah 7, which in Isaiah's lifetime was years later, because Isaiah 6 takes place in the time of uh, King Uzziah. Isaiah 7 takes place in the time of King Ahaz. But we don't worry about that historical break in time. We're looking at the Bible as God's word, and he, he providentially controls it. Isaiah is given a message to take to Adventism in Isaiah 6, and then the message is illustrated in Isaiah 7 onward through the following chapters. And it is the latter rain message. We've, when we've looked at Isaiah 7 and onward, um, we realize that the wicked king Ahaz um, he rejects Isaiah's warning message as represented by the waters of Shiloh, which in the New Testament is the pool of Siloam. And because he rejects it, he's going to get the, the flood of the Euphrates from the king of the north. But that illustration of the midnight cry or latter rain message by Isaiah directly connects with Rafi and Paneum because the ability to um, establish Russia as the king of the south in Daniel 11, 11 through 15, is based upon needing two witnesses. 
Um, and the two witnesses that we find is that in verse 10 of Daniel 11 and in verse 40 of Daniel 11 and in chapter 8 of Isaiah, you can see a war between the king of the north and the king of the south that the king of the north prevails. In each three of those passages, the king of the north wins over the king of the south and the Hebrew expression is that he overflows and passes over. And the Hebrew in each of those three passages, verse 10 of Daniel 11, verse 40 of Daniel 11, in Isaiah 8, is it, is it, anyone know exactly what verse that is in Isaiah? Um, Isaiah, the, the verse that is overflow and pass over, it's 8, 8, okay. 8.8, 8, we should see that as a reference to the midnight cry also, but um, this expression, he shall overflow and pass over, you have to read the whole passage. I never said it yesterday because this is a matter of public record. What's going on here from verse 5 onward is Isaiah is describing when the king of Assyria, if you notice in verse 7, is going to overflow his banks and he's going to capture Judah. So what is Judah? Judah is the king of the south. Isn't Judah the southern two kingdoms? Okay, who's the king of Assyria? He's the king of the north. So the, the structure of this passage, Isaiah 5, 8, verse 5 through 8, is a story of the king of the north defeating the king of the south. And that's what happens in verse 10 of Daniel 11, and it's what happens in verse 40 of Daniel 11. The king of the north defeats the king of the south, and when the defeat is illustrated, it's always the same Hebrew expression. In verse 8 of Isaiah 8, it says, He shall overflow and go over. In Daniel 11, verse 10, it says, of a, a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, that the king of the north wins. It says, he shall overflow and pass through. It's not quite the same in the English. And then in verse 40, when the king of the north defeats the king of the south, in verse 40, part B, it says, he shall overflow and shall overflow and pass over. Even though in each of the three verses, it, the English is a little bit different, the Hebrew is identical. So. Isaiah 8.8, 8, a doubling there, allowing us to mark the midnight cry, is the second witness. We're looking at verse 10, trying to recognize that the king of the south is Russia, not the Soviet Union, and we're looking for two witnesses to uphold our premise. Verse 40 is a witness, and Isaiah 8.8 8 is a second witness. So Isaiah 8 becomes connected with the story of Paneum, because verse 10 is what takes us to the history of 1989, uh, Daniel 11, verse 10. And verse 16 of Daniel 11 takes us to the Sunday Law. So verse 10 is 1989, slash 91. Verse 16 is the Sunday Law, and then we find in between verses 10 and 16, the Battle of Raphia and the Battle of Paneum. And in order to understand who the antagonists are in those battles of Raphi and Paneum, we have to establish that verse 10 of Daniel 11 is typifying the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. And in order to do that, uh, the witness that puts it in place is Isaiah 8.8. 8. But in connection with the passage in Isaiah 8.8, 8, it adds another component where it says that he, in verse 8, shall reach even to the neck, okay? And in order to understand what it means to reach to the neck, back in Isaiah 7, same prophecy, just a different chapter, we have two verses that, it, 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 those verses, I, I always found those verses interesting, but I never knew, I thought, you know, I never thought, but it just, what do they mean? Why do we have to know if you go to, um, verse 8 of Isaiah 7, the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And then in verse 9, the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. 
But you better know this. You better accept it because the end of verse 9 says, if you will not believe, surely you will not be established. But why do we have to have this distinction about the head of the, the nation? Um, and you, you finally, when the Lord removes his hand from Raphi and Paneum, and he gives you a second witness in chapter 8 of Isaiah, you realize that you need to understand what the Bible means about the king of the north coming to the neck. Because when Sennacherib comes in history, when he came to Judah, he took all of Judah, all the country of Judah, but he came up to Jerusalem and did not get Jerusalem. He didn't conquer Jerusalem. He just came up to the neck, and Jerusalem was the capital of Judah, and you had to understand that. And why did you have to understand that? You had to ha understand it so you had a point of reference to recognize that when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989-91, that the king of the south was still there, Russia. And we missed that. We had not seen that. And by not being, not being able to see that, we couldn't see that the struggle between Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump was a subject of Bible prophecy. And why am I saying Vladimir? Because the first leader of the Soviet Union was Vladimir Lenin. Yeah. And the last is a Vladimir. But what's Vladimir, Vladimir mean? <laughs> I'm not sure that I, that I remember the exact definition of Vladimir, but it's the same as Donald. Ruler of the world. Ruler of the world. Both of their first names mean something close to ruler of the world. Does anyone know the exact meaning of Vladimir? So I'm not chastised for misrepresenting. But anyway, they're the struggle. They're struggling to rule the world, just as the keys of this blood says. There's a three-way struggle to take control of the world between the Soviet Union, the United States, and the Catholic Church. So in Isaiah 8, um, and 7 and 8, we see, in Isaiah 8, we see the, the witness that we need to establish that Russia is the king of the south. If you follow that, say amen. Renown, ruler of the world or ruler of peace, famous ruler. Famous ruler, ruler of the world, ruler of peace, renowned prince. Um, I'm going to go with ruler of the world, which is what Donald means too. Okay, there, it's, it's the controversy between these two players. So you in Isaiah 8, you get your point of reference to establish that when the Soviet Union collapsed, the head was still there, Russia was still there. But you can't understand what Isaiah 8, 8 means even to the neck without Isaiah 7, 8, and 9, where it spe specifically tells you that the head of Ephraim is Samaria, the head of this country is the capital city, and the head of the capital city is the king that's ruling in the capital city. It takes two verses, repeats it so you could establishes it right in those verses and tells you, you need to believe this. If you will not believe, surely you won't be established. So it was important enough that it's to understand the neck in Isaiah 8.8, 8, you have to understand this double witness in Isaiah 7, 8 and 9. But what do you have in Isaiah 7, 8 and 9? you have the most important cornerstone for the 2520. In verse 8 it says, For the head of Syria, the nation, is Damascus, the capital city, and the head of the capital city of Damascus is King Rezin, and within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. There's your foundation for the 2520. So the 2520 is just connect, just right there is connected to Raphi and Paneum. The Lord removing his hand. He's, he's making sure that we see the 2520. And when Larry on Sabbath, and I heard someone say, put, put the disc together of these recent presentations of mine to send out whatever Brown was saying to Larry earlier. Um, you, need to, you need to include in there Larry's Sabbath sermon before, before the one I did yesterday because much of what I'm saying is, is based upon that and I reminded him when he was doing 126 and I'm going to re-emphasize it here that Hiram Edson 
He's the one that, that puts in place in history the distinction of the two 2520s in 1856. And Adventism had seven years to accept his, his light, and they reject it. And in 1863, their rebellion is marked in history, but it came after seven years from him putting that in place in 1856. But you go read his articles, and he's going to tell you more than once that the, the key, and he uses the word key, to open the mystery, and he defines the mystery as the increase of knowledge that comes when the book of Daniel is sealed, unsealed. So he's saying when the line of the tribe of Jews, Judah chooses to reveal prophetic light, the key that he uses is the 2520. That's what Hiram Edson says. And here we have the 2520 here in verse 8 of Isaiah 7. Um, and Hiram Edson, I'm positive, he doesn't understand when he's trying to explain in his articles how the 2520 is the mystery, the mystery key that opens up this light. He doesn't understand the verse that he chooses to use as his point of reference is the 2520. And, it, it, and go to Colossians 1.26. Because this, this is his point of reference. He's talking about um, the mystery that gets opened up by the 2520. And uh, what I'm saying, it, the, the light of the 2520 in his life had not developed to where we recognize that 126 is 1260 and 1260 is 2520. And, but his... His primary verse for all seven of his articles that he never finished is Colossians 1.26, which says, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. And in those articles, he is the one, he, uh, the primary one in, in Millerite history and in this movement. It's his seven articles that put in place Isaiah 7, 8. If you want to understand the 65 years and how it begins in, in 742, and then 19 years later, the northern kingdoms carried into captivity in 723 BC, and then at the end of that year at 677, it's in those articles by Hiram Edson, and he's saying that understanding is the key that opens the mystery of, of prophetic light. So. So, all I'm saying is that when you see that the study of Raphi and Paneum is connected with Isaiah being humbled in the dust in Isaiah 6 and then given a message, um, and, and in Isaiah 7, when Isaiah is going to give the message, who does he give the message to? He gives it to King Ahaz. And who's King Ahaz? He's a wicked king. I mean, he has his high priest go to um, Syria, I believe, Assyria, and make the blueprints for the Assyrian temple. And then he has the high priest come back to Jerusalem and build a duplicate temple in the courtyard of God's sanctuary. Shuts down God's service and raises up a pagan temple in the courtyard. That's King Ahaz. So what does that tell you? It tells you that when the midnight cry message comes, that there is going to be a counterfeit worship in place, and the people that aren't going to receive the message are going to be on the wrong side of the issue. What does that remind you of? 1 Kings 13. Verses, 1 Kings 12 33 and 34, 32 and 33, last two verses of 1 Kings 12 that gives us on the eighth day of the, f on the, read it? is it the fifth day? Or the 15th day? On the eighth month, the 15th day, two witnesses there. What verses are they? That's 32 and 33. Okay, so it puts the two witnesses that on August 15th, you need to see that in chap chapter 13, Verse 1 and on, where Jeroboam is setting up a counterfeit worship service in the northern kingdom, and the disobedient prophet comes to him and curses Jeroboam's altar, and what does he say? 
O altar, altar. So internally you have right there two witnesses with the, the day and the month and then the altar, altar, that this is the midnight cry. Therefore, this is a parallel passage to Isaiah. And Isaiah is dealing with a counterfeit worship service with Ahaz. Therefore, when the midnight cry message comes to this movement, because this is the movement of the 144,000, okay, how did this movement, where did Adventism begin? It began with the movement. How's it going to end? With the movement, okay? When did Adventism go into apostasy? 1863, when it rejected these two sacred tables. What did it also do in 1863? It organized a church in 1863. What did it cost James and Ellen White for doing so? Their oldest son. Okay, so it's going to begin as a movement. It ends as a movement. This is the movement of the 144,000. And when the, la the ma midnight cry, and I hope we understand that the latter rain and the midnight cry are just two interchangeable terms. When the midnight cry co message comes to this movement, based upon Loughborough's two dreams, the message is going to be based upon three primary elements. Okay, Ezra 7-9, which puts a structure on the line for us. First day of the first month, first day of the fifth month, tenth day of the seventh month. That structure's in place where we can go line upon line from the scriptures. Then Raphi and Paneum, and then the, the element of chronology. And although I haven't really spent a lot of time in this classroom, I spent a lot of time, all my time in South Africa, was doing Gideon. When we first started in this message, we did Gideon. And then a brother got connected with this message, um, who's no longer in this message. And he, he'd been in, in the islands out towards Hawaii and Australia, serving as a self-supporting pastor. And he came back to the United States to work with people he knew that were working with us at that time. And he, and he was familiar with everything we'd done in the past. And he says, and you really need to do Gideon over. You need to do it again. So we did Gideon, and the, the Gideon's torch that is available here at the ministry, if you want to look at it, it was did like halfway through this movement, but it was did, the difference between that presentation and the first presentation is the first time we did Gideon, we never knew anything about the 2520. The second time, we knew about the 2520. Okay, so it added a whole element to it. Because if you go to Judges, where Gideon begins, um, in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Okay, the first time we went through, we weren't going to see anything about that seven years. We weren't going to start the story of Gideon at the time of the end in 1798, after the 2520 William Miller's raised up. But in our movement, at, at the end of 126 years, okay, at the end of a 2520 in 1989, Gideon's raised up again. We didn't see that. So in the presentation on Gideon... What? Judges 6-1. Six, six, in the presentations that we did halfway through this movement, we then could see the 2520 and other elements we hadn't seen before. Uh, but then, in South Africa, when I chose to do it there, I, I realized things about Gideon going down into the enemy's camp where we could even put a date on it, okay? January 11th, uh, 2020, Gideon went down into the enemy's camp. And what he saw there uh, was a dream and the interpretation of thereof. And that expression, dream and interpretation thereof, is found 11 times in the scriptures. One time in the story of Gideon in chapter 7, verse 15. It says, And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Okay, so the other ten places in the scriptures that you will find this expression are in two chapters. Two chapters of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 2, 
is about the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And we've identified that in Daniel's last vision, which is being opened up now, um, verses 40 to 45, that there are four kingdoms that are under discussion. The kingdom of the dragon, the kingdom of the beast, and the kingdom of the false prophet. But there's also, as in Daniel 2, Daniel 2 has a stone that's cut out of a mountain without a hand, which is the 144,000, which is this movement. It's the kingdom of the 144,000. So there's four kingdoms. So we're seeing four lines, four kingdoms in Daniel 11, 40 to 45, because we went down into the enemy's camp and heard the dream and the interpretation thereof. That's Daniel chapter 2. But the other chapter where you can see that expression, dream inter interpretation thereof, is chapter 4. And what is chapter 4? It's the 2520 when Nebuchadnezzar lives as an animal for seven years, seven times, 2520 days. And at the end of the 2520 days, that would be the time of the end, right? Who's there waiting for him? Daniel. Okay, because at the time of the end, at the end, the book of Daniel is unsealed. Okay, so there's, there's a great deal of information that you can glean from that. What, what was that? Well, it was William Miller's second dream. Was it William Miller's second dream or was it Nebuchadnezzar's second dream? How many dreams did Nebuchadnezzar have? He had two. What, what, were, what were his two dreams? Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 4. Okay. How many dreams did Miller have? Two. His first dream is pretty, pretty, I, I can't explain it all. It's pretty profound. But what's his second dream? What's Miller's second dream? It's the 2520. It's the, the casket that grows from the beginning to the end. So Nebuchadnezzar's second dream is on the 2520. Miller's is on the second, uh, second dream is on the 2520. And when the Lord chooses to open this light up to us, beginning on September 7th, he takes us to Loughborough's two dreams so that we can see the three mud puddles, if you're seeing the connection. And what I'm saying is I'm trying to take certain passages of Scripture and show how they are directly connected to the midnight cry message of our movement. And when we go from Rafi and Paneum in Daniel 11, we go to Isaiah 6, 7, 8. We find our second witness for coming up to the neck, but we also find the 2520. And the 2520 is Daniel chapter 4. So Daniel chapter 4 becomes part of Daniel 11, as does Daniel 2 with the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. It's train and mud for Lothbrook. Is that the order of it? Yeah, his first okay. dream is about the train that has to be, uh, and uh, there's, there's no doubt if we're going to study these things throughout eternity, there's, there's no doubt things that we're not even coming close to seeing at this point. If we're faithful, we'll get to see him in eternity. But we know that one of the, one of the prophetic, the symbolic periods of time that we're dealing with is a 180, and how, how far do they turn that train around? 180 degrees, because it is reversed, and it's, the degrees are 360. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, in the Miller time period, at the removal of the hand, and we went back to the charts, it said it was one mistake in some of the figures, and then it established the 2520. Um, and the same thing with Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8, where the verse kind of is the removing of the hand and it establishes the 2520 at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, that's the point. It's bringing all these things together. So from there, one of the things that we mentioned yesterday also, but not directly, but I hope you're getting it, is in Isaiah 6, 7, 8 and onward, um, the, and there's other things I'm tempted to say about Isaiah 8, but I won't. That this vision that Isaiah has in chapter 6 of the glory of the Lord in the sanctuary, Sister White directly, more than once, says, in the visions given to Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John. 
Okay, and sometimes she might even add other prophets if you look closely, but those are the three primary ones. As we said yesterday, if it's the visions of John, then it's the vis visions of Daniel. The point of reference would be the, if you really want to isolate what the visions were, when the prophets see these visions, they're going to see God in the sanctuary. Was Isaiah in the sanctuary? Yes. Was Ezekiel in the sanctuary? Yes. Was John in the sanctuary? Yes. Yeah, so, so they're taken in, they see the sanctuary. And so Ezekiel tells us, as we said yesterday, when this experience that the prophets are illustrating of the 144,000, they're illustrating, the prophets are illustrating God's people at the end of the world. When is it that the light of the sanctuary is opened up to God's people? It's at midnight. Okay, and midnight's a period of time, but it's more specific than that. And this is a doubling, right? Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. Another doubling, if 1.1 1, 1 can be accepted as a doubling. We looked at this yesterday. Um, now it came to pass in which year? The 30th year. In the fourth month and the fifth day of the month. What's the fifth day of the fourth month in Millerite history? It's July 21st, which is midnight. Okay, but if you just take fourth month and fifth day, what is it? 45. It's 45. It's the history of the 45th president of the United States. As I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were open and I saw the visions of God. Yes? Why it's July 21st again? I, I always forget that. In 1844, April 19th is the first day of the first month. October 22nd is the 10th day of the seventh month. Sister White says midway, and the, when you divide it right in half, you'll find that the midway is July 21st, and midway is also midnight, and that is the first time that Samuel Snow presented the message of the midnight cry publicly and he did so in the Boston Tabernacle on J July 21st at midnight. He's going to do it again in Concord and then again at Exeter. Um, maybe maybe history is going to tell us that he spoke a few times along the way, but the three primary ones that we mark are Boston, Concord, and Exeter. Three primary times that Samuel Snow presents the Midnight Cry message. And it got really, <clears throat> got really overused with the other group. Got really overused with the other group, but my, well, my point is, is that this number three in the Midnight Cry, three mud puddles, okay? Concord. The, one of the, one of the, there was a whole group of Russian companies that Mueller brought cases against, uh, one of the primary ones, the only one that responded to his subpoenas was a Russian that supposedly was attacking Trump's camp or Hillary's campaign for Trump, and his company was named Concord, so they would talk about that. And yesterday, the Department of Justice dropped all those charges against all of those Russian companies. And the one guy they talked about was the guy that ran Concord. A bunch of, go ahead. And then yesterday you brought up something and I looked up the expression when I went home. You brought up elephant. Well, there's a common expression called elephant in the room. And it's something that nobody really wants to talk yeah. about or address. Yeah. It could be something portentous or troublous. So I feel like there was an elephant in this room in reality, in a spiritual sense that we Amen. just didn't see. There really Amen. was an elephant in the room. Really? Because you brought it up yesterday, and then I went, I wonder what that expression means, but it's something we were told we weren't allowed to speak during her presentations. That's a type of an elephant in the room. And I'm sorry to distract you. It don't matter. What, what, what I'm saying is that, is that and if, if you have the time, everyone seems to have time to do all the Googling, 
Um, if you have the time, you ought to go back into the papers that Theodore has written. For me, I do better reading Theodore's papers than I do listening to him speak. I, I don't mind listening to him speak, but I, it's easier for me to follow his papers. And one of the things he does, whether, whether you're aware of it or not, is he goes through and he marks the various dates in Ezekiel. Okay, the first date in Ezekiel is Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. And based upon the rule of first mention, the fact that there is a date, I mean, you go through and show me how many first verses of books of the Bible reference a date. Okay, I, I, maybe there are others, but it'd just be a few. But the fact that the first thing that happens in Ezekiel 1.1 1, 1 is that there is a date that is referenced, a date that both connects with Millerite history and our history, tells you, based upon the rule of first mention, that the book of Ezekiel has to do with dates. And one of the things that Theodore has went through the book of Ezekiel, and he's laid out how many dates there are in Ezekiel, and there are many that connect with Millerite history and our history. The last date, what is the last date referenced in Ezekiel, just for a curiosity's sake? I hope I'm right. And if I'm not right, I hope Theodore's listening today so he can correct me, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. What's the last date Ezekiel references? Tenth day of the seventh month. Okay, so he takes it... He, so in any case, this is a subject of Ezekiel, and it's in Ezekiel, in the, the, the prophecy of Josiah, that we get up here. Okay, this here is Revelation 9, but Revelation 9 is simply the second witness to Ezekiel's prophecy of Josiah. Okay, and Ezekiel's prophecy of Josiah, which Theodore solved here at the end of the world, um, it's the key that allows us to understand the significance of Revelation 9 that was opened up by Josiah. Okay, um, this... I won't, go, I won't try to do that right now, but I'm trying to make a connection here that the light that has come from Ezekiel is the light of the 391.5. Okay? And you go ahead. What was the light? I, I, um, what was the light that you're connecting with Revelation 9 that was opened up by Josiah? In a general, just a title? No, no, if you're going to ask in a general, I, I'm going to take some, I'll, I'll, sh I'll share it. I, I want, well, even if we know, I'm convinced that we haven't, those of us that know, we haven't settled into it well, well enough to get it yet, to see the significance. So I don't mind using your lack of memory to make this point. Because you have, you have to, this here is the second witness, okay? The first witness is Ezekiel. And you have to, you have to see these first two witnesses. What's the third witness? This will prove my point that we really aren't, we really don't get this yet. What's the third witness? If, if this prophecy of Josiah in Ezekiel is the first witness. Maybe you haven't settled into it, and it is. I'm going to show it to you in a moment. And if this is the second witness, and I'm saying if you're going to categorize those two lines, you categorize them as the 391. Okay. If those are the first two witnesses, what's the third witness? Brother Larry, what's the third witness? But that's a very vague and general and not correct answer. I mean, it may be correct, but it's not acceptable. Let's have some more specific specific no specificity. Be a little bit more clear. The third line that you would put here is the line of the Millerites in Samuel Snow. Okay, because that line is going to connect with this line and with Ezekiel lines. What's the fourth line? The fourth line is our history, which begins on a June 22nd and, and repeats not only Samuel Snow's history, but it repeats the 391 and takes us to November 9th. Okay, so if, if you don't have the foundation, 
it's pretty hard to know where to put the other pieces of the puzzle. And Ezekiel's vision, Ezekiel's Josiah prophecy is the foundation. This is the second witness that, that sheds light on Samuel Snow's publications, which is, those waymarks are repeated in the history of this movement. So these four witnesses, that if you took the time to lay out, are to prove July 18, 2020. This is our foundation to say that we're, this is the foundation of the prediction, those four lines. This is Daniel chapter 4. This is the chronology. Okay, Ezra 7 9 is the first mud puddle. Raphi and Paneum is the second mud puddle, and the chronology is the third mud puddle. The third mud puddle is the 2520, the 126, the 252, the 63. What's the, the, the last prime number? Do you know what a prime number is? What's a prime number? What's a prime number? Okay, they're going to Google it for us. What's the last one? Well, numbers get so big and, and, and weighty that they cease to be, it's impossible for them to be prime numbers any longer. Who's Googling it? Larry's trying to redeem himself after that bad, bad answer, so he's Googling full speed ahead. Largest known prime number? No, no. What, first define what a prime number is. No divisors, divisors other than one in itself. Positive integer. So it's two oh, it's going to be a big study. It, 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 take out the positive integer. A prime number is a number that is only divisible by one or itself. Is that what you, the last part says? Yes? Okay, so what's the largest one? 63. What does that mean? Well, <laughs> it's connected to the 2520. Is that the answer you got, my brother Larry? 63 is a special number in math, is all I was trying to say. You got something to add to that? Okay. 63 is the largest prime number? Yes. You got another one? It, uh, I, it, it, maybe her definition is weak. And then it's her bad, not mine. No. And maybe I can't explain it, but I read here recently that 63 is the largest, the last prime number. Yeah. Theodore will correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, it's wrong. The largest known prime number as of January 2020 is 20,862,048 digits doing. when it's used in base 10. It's found by Patrick LaRose, the great internet prime number search in 2018. That is incorrect. Okay, so what I read about 63 has just been as of January, what, 21st? As of January 21st, 2020, Ben. Cardinal. Maybe it's a cardinal that you're thinking of. Largest cardinal number. Largest cardinal number. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with what I want to show you. Okay, this is... Sister Brown or anyone else, what is that? What is that way, Mark? I don't know. That's King Saul. What's that? King David. King Solomon. What's this? It's 977. Yes? <coughs> Kingdom's been divided. That's, that's 1 Kings 13. This is the midnight cry. Is it not? It's the 15th day of the 8th month. O altar, altar. Okay, it's 977. What's that? That's Midnight Cry. That is September 7th. That was a Sabbath. Right? <coughs> we didn't do that yesterday. Okay, so 970, yeah, we did this yesterday in terms of this line. But I mean, this is a, this is a big deal here. 977, September 7th. 
This is a Sabbath. And it's September 7th, 977. So what happened on September 7th, 2019? The kingdom was divided. The majority is off worshiping Egypt. Why, are they, why am I saying they worship Egypt? Where, who is Jeroboam? No, Jeroboam, Jeroboam's a leader before, before this history. Jeroboam's a leader, and uh, he gets on the wrong side of Solomon, doesn't he? Correct me if I'm wrong. I've made a mistake on the 63, so this may be a, a wrong conjecture. What does Jeroboam do because he's on the wrong side of Solomon? This is, you're, you're, you're talking about 977. I'm talking about in the history of Solomon right here in this 40 years. What does Jeroboam do? He flees, he flees into Egypt. Okay, he goes to Egypt and he's going to stay in Egypt until when? Until Solomon dies. Okay, so when he comes back and he sets up this false altar, who, who has he been typified by? It says the identical words. At the, at the ceremony. Oh, as Aaron. Aaron. Aaron just came out of where? Egypt. Egypt. And Aaron builds a idol of Egypt, as Jeroboam does, and says, Here, O Israel, this is the gods that brought you out of Egypt. They both do it. Yeah. So on September 7th, on the Sabbath day, there's a division in this movement, and the one movement is going to begin to worship Egypt. What's Egypt? It's the dragon. It's CNN. It's the Jesuit order. Okay, this is 977. Solomon dies. The kingdom's divided. We're leaving a lot of little details out. This here is 586. And this is 587, though they're closely connected. And I mean, they're overlapped. This is the, this right here, this is the last king of Judah. Now back here you have Hosea. Who's Hosea? Last king of Israel, the northern kingdom. He's, he's removed in 723, which would be what, 150 years before here, roughly. But this now is the last king of Judah. So from here to here, what do you have? You have the history of the divided kingdoms, if, if that's the way to say it. And how, how many years is this? 391.5. Because you have six months in here. What is this six months? It's the final siege. It's the final siege. This is a siege. Okay, Jerusalem, Jerusalem falls. Maybe they don't have it here. Uh, they don't have it. Um, maybe someone here knows. Yeah, I think it's the 10th day of the 5th month. Jerusalem falls on the 10th day of the 5th month. in 586. But Jerusalem also fall, falls again. When? 70 AD. In 70 AD. On what day and what month? Tenth day of the fifth month in 70 AD. Jerusalem falls two times on the same biblical day. Was there a siege that preceded 70 AD? Yes. Okay, so there's... This siege back here, it's upon two witnesses. It's something that we need to understand, okay? But I, I, we're not dealing with the siege right now. What we're dealing with is that this period of the kings in the divided kingdom is where the 391 and a half comes from. This is the foundation of it. It's, here it's a half year. It's six months. It's 180 days, okay? But... 
when you get into the way marks that are here, the, this, is, this is the light that the Lord used Theodore to open up. And don't miss, where to go, it should still be in Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel 4. This is, this is where he lies on his side. Okay, I'm not going to put these way marks in there, <coughs> but he's going to lie on his side for the northern kingdom and lie on the other side for the southern kingdom. Verse 3 says, Lie also, thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of days that thou shalt lie, it, lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. He's bearing the iniquity of the northern kingdom. For I've laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of days, 390 days. So he's going to stay, lay on his left side for 390 days for the iniquity of the northern kingdom of Israel. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when, that has, uh, and when thou hast accomplished them, now go ahead and lie on your right side. And thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. What I want you to see is it's this here truth about where Ezekiel is in this history when he, when he lies on his left side and then his right side that opens this, this prophecy up. And this is the prophecy of Josiah. Why do we call it the prophecy of Josiah? was talking about Ozias, I mean, Josiah. Go to, go to 1 Kings 13, but, but what I want you to remember, please remember this. The passage in Scripture that Theodore was led to open up about Ezekiel lying on his left side and his right side, it opens up this prophecy of Josiah, but it connects you with Millerite history because it takes you to the second witness for the day-year principle. And it does so in Ezekiel 4.6. And what's 4.6? It's 46. This is, about, this is about the temple. Is this about the temple? Yeah, it's about the destruction of the temple. Okay, so this has a connection with the temple. It has a, a connection with chronology, with the history, also a connection with numbers, number 46, and a connection with Millerite history, because this is the second witness that Miller had to have in order to open up time prophecy. Numbers 1434. How important was the year-day principle to the Millerites? It, it is what was confirmed on August 11th, 1840. So this is connecting in a very strong way with Millerite history. And if you go to 1 Kings 13, the reason we're saying it's the Josiah prophecy, verse 1 says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests and the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Um, that's why we call it the Josiah prophecy. It's predicting that over here in this history, King Josiah is going to be born, and he becomes one of the waymarks that, that is a point of reference. How many years before Josiah is born? I think it's 350 years later. He's born, okay? So this Josiah prophecy, keeping it real simple, is the prophecy of the 391 and a half years. Yes? You see that at a real simple level? So when you get to Millerite history, you're going to see two 391s. They only see the one 391. They only see that. But now we know there's two 391s in Revelation 9. And who was it that the Lord used to open that up? Josiah Litch. And if I could turn right to Larry's notes, if I had Larry's notes, do you remember all your stuff? Uh, 
the, the little formula, it seems really, it, it, it seems really interesting, but maybe not so significant at first glance. Um, it's just a little play with uh, with numbers, so to speak. Okay, it's at the bottom of page two of these notes. Maybe you'll have to help me on this. It's 1840. If you take 1840, and what's 1840? Islam, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's Josiah Lich's prophecy coming to pass on August 11th, 1840. And you multiply it by what? 391.5. It equals... Seven hundred twenty thousand three hundred and sixty. Right? Yes? And three hundred and sixty is the symbol of what? Year day principle. So if you take this number and you divide it by three sixty, what's it come to? Two thousand one. What happened in two thousand one? Islam was restrained in two thousand one, just like it was restrained back here. But here in eighteen forty, we know that in Millerite history, number one. Sister White says the history of 1840-1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. She also says that the giving of the law at Mount Sinai was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. And the giving of the law on Mount Sinai took place in 1533 B.C. And from August 11th, 1840, to October 22nd, 1840, is 1533 days which was 1533 B.C. But we know, and the reason we know this is because Isaiah tells us that the 144,000 are going to be those that raise up the foundations of many generations. And how did the 144,000 raise up the foundation of many generations? They prove that in every reform movement, when the divine symbol comes down, the foundations are laid. Were the foundations laid after 1840 in the Millerite history? What's the symbol of the foundational work? The 43 chart. Were the foundations laid here at the end after 9-11, 2001? That's here. Were the foundations laid? And what's the symbol of the foundations in our history? The two charts. But the foundations here is this study of Revelation 9 that was put in place by Josiah Litch. But the numbers of this history, 391 being the key to this, show a connection between this foundation in 1840 and this foundation in 2001, yes? What does Josiah mean? Foundation. foundation. Josiah Litch is used to lay the foundations here, but the foundation of Josiah Litch's work that he never saw was the Josiah prophecy over here. This is the foundation. This is the first mention of the 391. And this 391 we, we find through Josiah Litch has to do with what? Islam, 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 Islam. 
what's this 391 speaking about? The destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, the destruction of Jerusalem. When does the destruction of Jerusalem take place? The midnight cry. Why? Why does the destruction of Jerusalem take place at the midnight cry? What's this? The, what's the beginning of this prophecy? Midnight cry. Midnight cry. What is the midnight cry? It's where the Lord chooses Jerusalem. And we've taught for several years now that there is a choosing of a righteous Jerusalem at the same time that there is a destruction of the unrighteous Jerusalem. The unrighteous Jerusalem gets taken out as the other Jerusalem gets lifted up as an ensign. And how many times does this happen? Twice. Twice. Because the midnight cry is the first Sunday law. And the Sunday law of verse 41 is the, what we would call the loud cry, which is still the midnight cry. So there's a, a choosing of Jerusalem in the history of the sixth kingdom, and then a choosing of Jerusalem in the history of the final kingdom of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. It's a development, first the priests, then the Levites. Then Jerusalem's in place. So do you understand this now? And I, and I left out a bunch of way marks about Josiah, about the Passover, about the breaking down of the altars. But when you have this in place, when you have the 391, that line here, lining up with this 391, and then you put the line of Samuel Snow here, and then you put the history of this movement here, it's incredible. Say that the Millerites had Josiah Lich in his 391, and, <clears throat> and the 144,000 have Josiah of Ezekiel in our 391. We have a doubling. We have both Josiahs. But our special one is the Ezekiel Josiah prophecy. Is it? I don't know. <clears throat> Millerite history is the beginning of our history. We're the end, so there's a beginning end emphasis chart in 43. So now we've got the first one and the second one when we bring our foundations in. We bring in two. So we bring, we bring all, in several foundations. We and you are not on the same wavelength. We, we have all the foundations of every generation. That's... Okay. That's... That's what the lines are. Yeah. Not those. But, I mean, the lines that we, we can build. With but all the Millerites weren't understanding Ezekiel's Josiah's the Millerites didn't understand this part of Revelation 9. Yeah. They didn't. This also is the work of Theodore. And they didn't. No one in the, in the Christian world understood this about Ezekiel. Okay, so this comes to light. This comes to light. And what happens when this comes to light? There's someone that. There's a human being that saw the relevancy of this probably before everyone else. Who was it? Oh, they answered not a word. Who do you, who do you think probably saw it first? Okay, that's the way to say it. Satan's advocate. I was, I was trying to tempt you to say it was Theodore, because Theodore was used to see these things. But Satan's advocate, he began fighting everything that Theodore would contribute. Okay, and begin to throw dirt upon all of this, and, and, and it's their it's their it's their battle cry now. All right, and the people that used to be in this movement that, that left at prior times that are still following this movement. I wonder why. I wonder why they still send me emails, letting me know why I'm wrong about what I'm teaching. Why are they worrying about what I'm teaching or what this movement's teaching if they've determined it was darkness and they left so long ago? But they're still watching, and. Therefore, it tells me that the reason that we're involved in the movement in the first place and the thing that still draws them in to recognize the authority of this movement is the line upon line application that we use. And the line upon line application that we're using is the same methodology we've used from the beginning. And it, it is just as powerful. It's more powerful now than it ever was before. Um, and... These lines here of the 391s, 
they are absolutely part of the midnight cry message. And to be fighting it is to be fighting the Holy Spirit, fighting God. Um, I'm going to take just a little bit more time now to, to sorry, um, if that's a problem for you. I wanted to get to reading Desire of Ages, chapter 45 and 46. And when we do that, it will be on the premise that chapter 45 is representing the history of Donald Trump, the 45th president of the United States, uh, the history of 777, and that chapter 46 has to do with the temple. Okay, and chapter 46 of Desire of Ages is talking about the transfiguration. But I'm not going to do that. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something in advance of this that we'll take up tomorrow. Go with me, if you would, to Matthew 16. Now, I should, I'm going to take my time a little bit on this, even though I'm over time. Um, but the logic that, I'm still on the logic I started with. That being that in Isaiah 7, 8, we see the 2520, and in Daniel 4, we see the 2520. Therefore, the 2520 is part of the midnight cry message, and everything that's connected with the 2520, whether it's the 63s, the 126s, the 252s, everything connected with it, the chronology, the numerical patterns, are part of the midnight cry message, based upon the weight of evidence. But we build all that upon Daniel 8.13 with Palmoni, and I'm arguing that if Palmoni and Daniel 8.13 is the wonderful number, and it is, and he is, that we should find a second witness for that. And I'm saying the second, second witness for Palmoni being the wonderful number is Matthew 16. Uh, second witness being the New Testament, first witness being the Old Testament. And I've never found, for myself personally, a passage in the scriptures that is more, more that has more in it about the wonderful number than chapter 16 of Matthew. So I want to read through this and say a few things and then we'll end. And then tomorrow when we come back to the Desire of Ages, hopefully we can bind these thoughts off. The purpose for doing this is that when Jesus is in Matthew 16 in Caesarea Philippi, that is the name of the town when Jesus was alive, but the name of the town as we know it is Paneum. Okay, this is Paneum. And therefore, this has a direct connection to Daniel 11, verses 11 through 15, Raphia and Paneum. This also becomes one of those lines that has to be directly connected to the midnight cry message. You follow my thoughts? And the first time that we discovered this was in 2017, the beginning of 2017. And when this was opened up to us, we made predictions, okay? based upon what comes out of here. And I, I want to remind some people about it. We predicted a pandemic and panic, okay, among other things. And so we've identified that Paneum, for the line of the Constitution for the United States, arrived last month. And here we are in the middle of panic, and a pandemic, all right? So go ahead, just putting that in the record. So let's read down through this and then we can close. Verse one of, of Matthew 16. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came. The first thing that's mentioned in this chapter is the conservatives and liberals. And what Daniel has opened up is that all these lines in Daniel have to do with the struggle between conservatives and liberal. And which was Jesus? Which was Jesus? He was neither. Okay. He's, he's, he's not a Pharisee. He's not a Sadducee. But the, the story is a struggle between humanity in any realm, whether it's political, religious, or any other realm, humanity's the struggle is conservative, liberal. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, so the, the, the first, and we had an argument about this with the, with the soldier, okay? And the soldier is the second 
mud puddle. Okay? And this, this particular passage, is, passage was an argument. And I want to, want to just tell you right off the bat, the sign, the true understanding of the sign is the message. This is about a message. Okay, he had some whacked out, probably still has some whacked out ideas. Because he goes, he goes beyond P and T. Okay, the soldier is going to go beyond. <coughs> they end at the midnight cry. He's going to end at the Sunday law. Based upon the prophecy of Fatima. That's another story. But I want you to want to tell you the sign here, according to the Spirit of Prophecy in the Bible, is the message. But it's an issue in this history. The issue is, can you see the sign? He answered and said to them, "When it is evening, you say it is will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, you hypocrites! You can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times?" A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. What's the wicked and adulterous generation? The fourth generation. Okay. If there's a wicked generation, what is there? According to Daniel. Righteous or wise and foolish. Okay. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. So what are they looking for? They're looking for uh, the Russians to bring out some dirt on, on Trump that he'll get impeached. They're looking for a sign. Okay? But the reality of it is the only sign that's given to the fourth generation is the message. It's about the message. You have to decide about the message. And who is Jonah? This Jonas here. You know, there's no sign given except the prophet Jonas. That's the Greek for who? Jonah. What does that mean? Dove. Dove. What did he do? He gave a warning message that said a, a city was going to be destroyed. Was there an element of time connected with it? Yes. Yes. He gave a time prophecy about the destruction of a city. Okay, and that was the message that Jonah gave, and there's no sign given in this generation except the prophet Jonas. Okay, verse 5. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, of the liberals and the, the conservatives. Beware of the leaven of Fox News and CNN News. Amen. Okay? Um, beware of the teachings of the black pope or the white pope. Uh, beware of Putin or Trump. It's, it's just, it's present truth. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason you among yourselves, because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Do you not remember what? The bread. Okay, you get to a point in time where you're unsure what the message is. Right? Because it's about the message. The message is the prophet Jonah. These are the disciples. These are the 144,000. In a minute, you're going to see that Peter is a symbol of the 144,000. He's the disciples. They're at a point in time where they don't, they don't know what the message is. What's the message? It's the bread. Yes? Okay, and what does Jesus say to them? Don't you remember how the message came in your past history? Have you forgotten how the Lord has led in this movement since 1989? Weren't they there with the 5,000 and the 7,000? They had forgotten. Their faith now is on CNN. You know, it, it's been removed from them. Okay, I mean, if you can see it, you can see it. Verse 9, Do, you, do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up, neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 
and how many baskets you took up. You know, I mean, we can, that comes to 12,000, 12 being a number of the 144,000, and the, the 4,000 and the 5,000 is 45. Okay, if you want to see it, 45th President of the United States, and this is about the 144,000. It's about the 144,000 who on September 7th had forgotten how the Lord had led them. Okay? Um, Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up. Verse 11. How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The doctrine of CNN and Fox News. Okay. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Yes. Interesting. Here in 16.12, he's, he's given a parable here, but it's no secret. He makes the parable just, it's parable telling, but he's just flat out. There's no secrets Amen. about the parable telling. Amen. At yeah. this very period of time when we're told parables, how do you interpret it? Jesus is just dead clear about how he's interpreting that parable. Oh, so when was it? This was September 7th. This is well, it was even before that. Reminding him. This, this, like this is, he is in Caesarea Philippi which is Paneum. He's in Paneum, and he's about to tell them for the first time about the cross. What's the cross? Well, the cross is either the midnight cry for the priests or it's the Sunday law for the Levites. He's about to, to tell them either about July 18th or December 25th. And when he told it to them is when he was in Caesarea Philippi. It was in the year 2017. That's when he opened up Paneum. That's when he opened up this passage. So from 2017... Jesus, the parables, are no longer anything but perfectly clear. And anyone that is suggesting otherwise is an enemy of God. But that was suggested right. many, many times, and it was just poo-pooed. Verse 13. It should be clear, the fact yeah, that... The, yeah, verse 13. But, but, but now we're seeing the Lord opening up this clearly from the prophetic word, just the case. We... We here, we were uncertain. We'd forgotten. The first part of this, don't miss it. This isn't just kind of a, a casual conjecture. We had forgotten how the Lord had fed us in this movement when we reached this history. Yes. And that's what took us away. Okay, we'd forgotten our foundations. We'd forgotten that He gave us the bread. Okay, so in verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the apostles, verse 14, and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. What's the discussion in the movement? Mm -hmm. who's, who's John? Who's Elijah? Who's Elisha? No, who's um, yes. Samuel Snow? Yeah, Samuel Snow. I'm but Samuel you, Snow. No, you I'm Samuel 13. Snow. 13. Verse 13 is the verse of rebellion, and that's their rebellious taunt to us. How readest thou? And you could say that that is the words that he's saying. How readest thou? Okay, Just, verse 13. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. What's Caesarea Philippi? Panium. Panium. But here, what is it? It's Caesarea Philippi. And in your notes, I think I probably have that. Um, Caesarea means Caesar. Okay, but Caesar is not simple. But let, you, you can keep it Roman if you want to. The Caesars are Roman, are they not? And the Roman Empire divided into ten kingdoms. And Sister White says, commenting on Revelation 12, she says the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. Yes? So all ten of those kingdoms are what? They're dragons. And in the French Revolution, one of them becomes the premier dragon power of prophetic focus. Who's that? France becomes the king of the south, dragon power. But it's going to migrate to where? Russia. Okay, but Caesar, Caesar is a symbol of the leader of Rome. In fact, a word for Caesar is what? Oh, Czar. Czar. What's the head of Russia? 
Czar. That's a Roman term. Okay. So in this town, you've got two personages. You've got the king of the south. And you have Philip. What's Philip? Horses. Lover of horses. Who's the horse in Bible prophecy? Yeah, Islam. Islam. So you've got Russia and Islam at Paneum. Ah, there's another witness. We, last week we put witnesses in from the trumpets. You remember? Attila the Hun, Russia and Islam. And in the second woe, Muhammad hires or, Orban? Yeah. Urban. Yeah. Urban, the European weapon maker to give him the cannon to blow down Constantinople. Here's another witness that at Paneum, Caesarea Philippi, you both have Russia and Islam. Right? Okay. And what else do you have? <coughs> you have two names for one city. It's a doubling. Caesarea Philippi. And you have, what are you saying? The disciples? You have Jesus and then you have disciples that are doubting. You have four players there. And so you're saying that the question, the of, question of, it's there in verse 13, therefore this is what the rebellion is about. Who is Jesus? How readest thou? How readest thou? Now, Because he's the word. Jesus is the word. And so if you say, who say I am, it's the same as asking. Okay, you're, you're, you're identifying how this rebellion has been expressed in our movement, mm -hmm. but I want you to, to focus on the, the more generic part of that. In verse 13, where the rebellion is illustrated, the question is, who is Jesus? Okay, keep it simple like that. Because later on, Peter is going to be a symbol of those that, that recognize the Messiah. Okay, um, verse 14, And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. This is the controversy in this movement. Who is Samuel Snow? Um, verse 15, And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay. What Simon mean? It means to hear. Yes. And what's Peter mean? <clears throat> the rock. Okay, so if you're going to hear the rock, what are you going to hear? Jesus. Yeah, that's right. He's the rock of ages, but that wasn't, that's close, but no cigar. Okay. If you, if, if everyone in this room is going to hear Peter, who, who, what are you going to hear? The message. What message? Wonderful. This message. Sister White says this foundational message has been her guide her entire life and it is as the rock of ages. Okay, so this is a group of people that are standing on the foundation. Yes? To recognize Jesus at any time in history is to recognize the message. They're, they're one and the same. Can't separate the message from the messenger. Okay, so, but, but I, I'm trying to make this specific to our history, so that's why I'm taking a little bit of time here. But because he, he's not going to remain Simon Peter, is he? He's, he, he's going to be called something else. Uh, verse, verse 17, uh, but, but he says, what does Peter respond? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When was Jesus the Christ? At his baptism, not before. Yeah. He's the Messiah, he's the Christ. Jesus. At his baptism, because it means the anointed one, and that's where the Bible says Jesus was anointed. Okay, so this is someone that recognizes the way mark where Christ was baptized. Where was he baptized? In our history. 9-11. Okay, 9-11, you have to see that message of 9-11 is the message of the Son of the living God. All right. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Peter. No, 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 no. See, his name just got changed. When does your name get changed? At 
9-11, Jeremiah says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, for I'm called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Okay, when do we eat, when do we eat the bread that comes down from heaven? At 9-11, John goes and takes the little book out of the angel's hands and eats it, sweet in his mouth, bitter in his stomach. So, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Now, now it's hearing what? The message bar means son of, Jonah means dove. Here, this is where this story started. There's only one sign given to this generation. It's the sign of Jonah. And Peter is someone that hears the message of the dove. <coughs> when did the dove come into Peter's history? At the baptism. Peter is someone that understands 9-11. And his name is changed because of that, because he entered into a covenant relationship, because that's when he ate the little book. Okay, um, For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, and what is Revelation 16, 18? It is the mathematical symbol for phi, P-H-I. The mathematical number for phi, Pi is 16.18, and there's some other numbers, I think. And for phi, not pi. Pi and phi are different. Um, so this is a mathematical number that needs to be addressed. But I'm only saying that it's here because I'm going to try to make the case sometime in the near future that this is a second witness to the wonderful number of Palmoni. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What rock is he going to build his church upon? The foundation. When, when was the foundation laid? 9-11. Peter understood the foundational message of 9-11, the message of the dove. And that's where the church is built upon. That's why all these people that leave, one way or the other, they attack 9-11. That is what his church is built upon, is 9-11. Okay, so Larry showed us the numerical value of Peter. What is it? 144,000. P times E times T times E times R equals 144,000. That's who Peter is here. And, and, a build that should, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What are the gates of hell? There's a controversy here, the great controversy. God's church versus the gates of hell. What are the gates of hell? The gates of hell are the name of the temple, the satanic temple in Paneum, in Caesarea Philippi. There's a temple. The most famous New Age temple in the world is in Paneum. And the name of that temple in that history was the gates of hell. Okay, it's the Temple of Pan. Everyone know that. Okay, so it's not an accident that Jesus is there in the very place saying, my church is going to be in a warfare with that church, and it's the gates of hell, and they will not win. Okay, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt buy. First, now, what's the keys of the kingdom of heaven? It's God's word. All of his words are his keys. All of his words. She's going to comment on it in Desire of Ages. We'll read that tomorrow. It's his word. We get the word of God. Okay? It, it, what do they get? We think it's CNN. Okay. We're standing upon the word of God. We get the keys of heaven to guide us into our prophetic light. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What's the word of God that we're given? The, the, the primary, one of the primary points of reverend, reference, I would argue, is the 391. Okay, uh, when you see the 391 playing out from Ezekiel to Revelation 9 to Millerite history to our history, and the 391 is clearly a symbol of the foundation for Millerites, the foundation for us. And the 391 is clearly a symbol of Islam. What does Revelation 9 
and other places in the scriptures speak about Islam. What's the first thing that happens to Hagar, the mother of Islam, the mother of Ishmael? There's a restraint placed upon her by Sarah. Okay, Islam, the word of God that's given to us is the insight of Islam. What is bound, what is loosed. Does Revelation 9 talk about four angels that are at the Euphrates that are bound and they, then they're loosed? How long are they loosed for? For 391.5 years. Okay, <laughs> that's, we're given the keys of the kingdom and the context of the, kings of the, the keys of the kingdom here is Islam. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that Jesus was the Christ. That he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, now here's the point I want you to see. From that time, and I'm saying this is probably February, March 2017 for us. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and to be raised again the third day. Two things. From that point, he's going to tell them about the crucifixion and the lifting up of the ensign. And the crucifixion is the Sunday law. The crucifixion is the midnight cry. The crucifixion is the Sunday law and the midnight cry. They're both Sunday laws. And in those histories, there's an ensign lifted up. There's an ensign of the, the priests lifted up for the Levites. And then there's the ensign of the priests and Levites lifted up for the Nethanims at the, both of those Sunday laws. And the Lord doesn't bring, begin to bring these things into clarity till the beginning of 2017 when he takes us to Paneum, when he takes us to Caesarea Philippi. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. <coughs> but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. What's Peter illustrating here? Peter's the 144,000. And he's the, the other side. This is, Peter is illustrating both the wise and the foolish virgins. And what's the controversy? Peter believes, over, believes in 9-11 and he's the 144,000. He disbelieves in it. He disbelieves in the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he becomes the wicked. It's saying that in this history, when this is opened up, what, what happens? The separation process of the two classes. Right? Everyone seeing that? Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my, sakes, for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there may there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There be some people standing in 2017 that are going to be alive when Jesus returns on the right side of the issue. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for every way that you've revealed yourself to us, but when we consider the, the numbering that you have encoded into your word, um, it's amazing. We know it's not the only component of the message that you've opened up, uh, but we are thankful that you've allowed us to be among those that can recognize at least part of this light. We ask that you continue to open this word to us uh, that we might be better prepared in our own experience and better prepared with the message to give those we come in contact with. We have many, many persons that we're praying for here in this ministry, uh, in this area and around the world. We lift them up according to your will. We ask that you would heal and correct and uh, accomplish the needs of every one of those prayer requests in Jesus' name.
Amen.